Luke chapter number one. You know, I was thinking while Gail was singing, I knew why she sat over there, stood over there, because we didn't have a stool in the back. So, <laughs> otherwise you would just saw this little bit right there. And uh, I didn't say that the first service, but I, I, I thought about it the first service, so. Um, but I'm thankful for her and John being able to play the piano as well. Yeah. <laughs> Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter number one. Verse 26, it's amazing how the Lord orchestrates things because, as you know, we preach verse by verse, and um, it just so happens that on Mother's Day, we're talking about Mary and the announcements of the birth of Jesus, and uh, I think the Lord orchestrated that and um, give us the ability to talk about one of the greatest mothers that ever existed, and, and in this lesson, we not just learn about Mary, but we're learning about the incarnation of Christ. And it's the greatest news that Israel was ever presented in one of the most humble of their people, and that was the people of Nazareth. But we have to get some background to what's taking place. So let's read verse 26 through 29 real quick, and then we're going to talk about Mary as a mother and who she was. Verse 26, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man, whose name was Joseph, in the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. So we see Mary is one of the greatest mothers and best examples for us to live our Christian life. So some truths about Mary here in this passage. Mary is one of the most significant women in history. One of the most significant mothers in history. And she was specifically chosen by God to bring Jesus into the world. Now, I, I don't think if any of us were in that position and required the ability to raise the Son of God, we would all be terrified. Now, I also said that it is a little bit easier to raise a child who is perfect in every sense of the imagination. Never talk back, never disobey. I look at my children at times I'm like, man. So yes, Mary, as, this, as Jesus grew up, she was noticing that Jesus was a perfect, sinless man. And her, realizing that she is not perfect... I'm certain that that was hard in every sense of the imagination, but some truths about Mary is, it says Mary was a pure woman. It means she was a virgin. From the Greek word, that means a, a maiden by implication, an unmarried daughter or a virgin. Mary was a virgin. And Mary, before this point, she was betrothed. She was committed to be married, but she was pure. She lived a pure life. She was a virgin. She was untouched, unscathed by things of the world at that time. But not only was she a pure woman, she was a prepared woman. And what do I mean that she was prepared? Well, it says in Matthew 1.18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. She was preparing her life to live a normal life for the Lord. Whatever God had for her, she was going to do it. She was prepared. She, it says she was a spouse to a man named Joseph. Now, the espousal period uh, was uh, after a couple is legally bound in marriage. They are legally bound in a marriage contract, but the couple has not consummated their marriage yet, so they haven't been together physically. And sometimes this espousal period, this betrothal period, took time, sometimes it lasts as long as a year, allowing for the husband to go and prepare his home for his wife. I'm certain that he probably took a long time. He probably had to get everything ready. Uh, men, if you were to live by yourself, you would be comfortable with a mattress on the floor and then a TV and just a couple little things, and then you're good. Joseph, very much probably the same way, had to get his home ready for his wife to be like, yeah, I'll, I'm willing to live there. Um, but she was prepared. She was saying, God, whatever you have for me, I'm willing to do. I'm preparing my life to live for you. She was a pure woman. She was a prepared woman. Uh, Isaiah 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So we see that Mary, she 
was a prepared woman. God would not have sent his son if Mary wasn't living a life that was prepared to serve him. Not only was she a pure woman or a prepared woman, but Mary was also a preferred woman. What does it mean? It says she was highly favored. It means that word phrase, highly favored, means she was full of grace. She lived a graceful life. Now, this is, a, is something that every one of us should know as mothers and fathers. And if we don't have any children, living a graceful life, being a preferred person, says she was highly favored and full of grace. Because God chose her to be the mother of Jesus, she was going to be blessed among other women. And although Mary's testimony is truly remarkable, we have to realize that she was used by God in a special way to bring the Savior into the world, even though she was still like the rest of us. She was still a sinner in need of a Savior. And unfortunately, there are many people who have elevated Mary to uh, above the teaching of Scripture. But we see that Mary, she was a pure woman. She was a prepared woman. She was a preferred woman, full of grace. Now, that full of grace aspect show, tells us that if Mary was full of grace, then we can also be full of grace. That's why we're going to talk about that a little later in Scripture. But there are many times throughout Scripture that we are called to be filled with grace. You know, there are, there are many, many opportunities for us to show grace, be grace-filled. I think many times when I talk to my children, and I know it's not just me, but other mothers and fathers in here as well, you tell your children to do something, they don't listen, and you're trying to be grace-filled, and you're, then you're kind of gritting your teeth and be like, I'm going to be full of grace. I'm going to be kind. I'm full of grace. Now, Mary was a woman who, as a mother, exemplified what it means to be pure, what it means to be prepared, what it means to be preferred, full of grace. This is something that every one of us can learn, because so often in a world that is so chaotic and a world that is so brash, gracefulness is often missed. So although we see Mary's testimony is remarkable, you now she was used by God in a special way, she is still, like the rest of us, a sinner in need of a Savior. She needed a Savior. So in understanding some truths about Mary, we know what Mary is now. She is uh, a pure woman, a prepared woman, a preferred woman. We're kind of giving this background to before we get into the passage. So we know what she is. Let's talk about what she isn't. There are many people who teach that we pray to Mary. We don't pray to Mary. As a matter of fact, uh, a Hail Mary prayer wasn't even in existence until 1495 A.D., 1400 years after Jesus had died on the cross and rose again, and it was given in an exposition by Italian Ferrar Salvanarola. And now see, we understand that praying to Mary is not compatible with biblical doctrine. What scripture says is impossible to pray to Mary, as Jesus instructed us to pray in his name. We pray in his name, not Mary's name, not an apostle's name. We don't have to pray. Thankfully, you don't have to pray through me to someone else or to anyone else. We talk directly to him. That's why John 14, 13 through 14, we get, shows us that we talk through Jesus. We have direct access to the Father. It says, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, then I will do it. So we see from Scripture, we don't pray through Mary. As a matter of fact, that wasn't even a, a thing up until 1495 AD. Also, one thing about Mary that we have to understand, although she was a pure woman, although she was prepared, although she was preferred, we don't pray to Mary. Also, there are some people who teach the, the perpetual virginity of Mary. And you think, well, how can that be possible? The, the virgin... Uh, the, the Catholic responsive liturgy for the feast of the Lord's preparation, quote, said, the virgin conceived and gave birth to a son, yet she remained a virgin forever, end quote. Now we know that that's impossible based on scripture. Matthew 13, 55 says, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James, and Joseph, and Simon, and Judas. So we know just from this passage, doesn't even say anything about sisters, just says he had four brothers. Jesus had four other half-brothers. So to look at Mary and saying that, oh, she was a perpetual virgin, is impossible based on Scripture. Also, another false belief about Mary is that people say that Mary is our co-redeemer. They say, 
Who believes that? Why would somebody believe that an individual can redeem us? You know, there are teachings that Mary is necessary as the intercessor to obtain salvation, and that is not true. We cannot go through Mary to obtain salvation. She's not our redeemer. That's heresy, and that that is blasphemous to the Lord Jesus Christ. If we believe in Jesus, to have the stance that Mary is a co-redeemer is blasphemous to who Jesus is. Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. Say, what do you mean people believe that? Well, here's a quote from St. Bernard. He said, Mary is called the gate of heaven because no one can enter that blessed kingdom without passing through her. Now, that is inaccurate because John 14, 6 in, in, intentionally tells us, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Mary is not my co-redeemer. So the reason we're going through this is because there's so often mistakes on who Mary is and who Mary isn't. So in preparation, we understand, no, we don't pray to Mary. Mary never never remained a virgin and didn't have perpetual virginity. Mary is not our co-redeemer, and these are all based on Scripture. But we do know that Mary was a woman that was pure. We do know she was a woman that was prepared. And we do know that she was a woman that was preferred, full of grace. So now with that understanding, that background, let's hop into our text this morning and talk about what it means to be a mother. And these not just apply to mothers, but this applies to fathers and for us as individuals if we aren't married and have no children. So let's pray real quick and we'll hop into our message. Lord, I pray that you help us today as we open your word and be able to celebrate motherhood today and be able to get the example that we have to have as as individuals and how to live our life for the Lord how to live a life separated for you. Lord, I'm thankful for this, this illustration of what it means to be a mother here in Mary. And Lord, I pray that you help us to take these words and apply it to our life, whether we are a man or a woman, whether we are young or old, whether we are married with children or we're not. Lord, I pray that there is something in this message that we can all apply to ourselves this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 30. It says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom there shall be no end. So number one, we see number one, the message to Mary. Mary was given a message. And when Gabriel greeted Mary, she began to ponder why this angel had come to her. It's like, what's taking place? And, Mary, and, and the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary, gave her this message, and she said, look, you found favor with God. You have found favor. Mary was a lady, when she found favor, that means she was full of grace, like we just said. So Mary, as a lady who found favor, was just meaning she was a lady that was full of grace. And in the day where men and women are often caustic and often brash, graceful people stand out. And I know that as it is here for Mary is the same for us, is that there are just people we lack grace. We lack being graceful. We're not not filled with his grace. And Mary was a humble lady who who desired to live for God. That was her intent. That was her desire. God, whatever you have for me, I want to live for you. That's why James chapter 4, verse 6, it says, but he giveth more grace. He giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. That, That means that for us as individuals to live a life full of grace, we are humbling ourselves before God, and he's providing more grace. It means Mary lived a humble life. Her goal was to just, she was planning on marrying Joseph. She was planning on raising her children. She was a humble woman. Which is interesting for us is that because she was one of humility, we often elevate her so high above everybody else. If you were to ask Mary, Mary, we'll see it. Mary called herself a handmaiden or a, a slave to God. So why is it that Mary would hold herself to such low esteem and humility, but we often elevate her to something far exceeding anything else that she was meant to be from Scripture? But from this message to Mary, we see she has favor with God. She said, look, yeah, favor, you, you are living a life full of grace. You're, you're humble. I think more important than any other aspect of our life 
is the, t- the fact that men and women need to be full of grace and humble. You know, when God often tries to use us, we often pride ourselves in what's taking place in our life. We pride ourselves in how God's working in our life rather than humbling ourselves and giving, giving, giving the favor, showing, showing uh, our love to the Lord and following him and being humble. So she had favor with God, but not only that, she, he said she was going to have a son and his name was going to be Jesus. Now, Jesus is Greek for the Hebrew name Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. The idea is being communicated that Jesus had come to deliver Israel and God sent his son Jesus to be a savior. And he was telling this was going to be who it was for Mary. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none un, no, no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We are saved through Jesus Christ. It says he was going to be son of the highest. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost. He wasn't merely a man. He wasn't just a person. He was God incarnate in the form of a man. That's why Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, it says, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. He said he was son in the highest. Not only was he son in the highest, but Gabriel said that he was going to be of the tribe of Judah and of the house of David. That means that this passage is referencing the fact that Jesus Jesus was coming to fulfill all of the promises that God had made to David. That the kingdom will be established and he was going to reign forever in his second coming when he comes again. So Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. See, Gabriel was coming and he was explaining these things to Mary. Why? Because he was showing in the words that he said that they were, they were fulfilling Old Testament prophecy from over 500 years prior that Jesus was coming and was going to be the Son of God. That was the message to Mary. He wanted to come and tell Mary she was full of grace. And because she lived a grace-filled life, God was wanting to use her. You know, it's always interesting that we live our life and we want God to work on our life, but we do not live a grace-filled life. We live a life that is brash. We live a life of our own desire and our own will. And then we step back and say, oh, I don't know why God won't use my life. Well, it's because we don't, do not live that grace-filled life that we're meant to live. And we see the message to Mary, but let's look at verse 34. Luke chapter 1, verse 34. It says, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. So not not only do we see, number one, the message to Mary, but number two, we see the miracle of the conception. So there is no doubt that this is one of the greatest miracles that were laid out in Scripture, and that's the divine conception of Jesus Christ. This was the greatest miracle that was going to be performed. And it's amazing to me that there are Christians who do not believe in the virgin birth of Christ. You know, the reason Jesus had to be born of a virgin was because, as Scripture says, sin is passed down through the man's seed. So because of that, we, he could not have been born from someone who wasn't a virgin. And it is interesting that people say, well, I just don't believe that'll happen. But they are Christian. It's like, so you believe that Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose again but you can't believe that he was born of a virgin. 
I would say it's a lot more difficult to believe that Jesus rose himself from the dead than it is to believe that he was born of a virgin. And we see that this is just one of the greatest miracles of conception. This was because, this miracle of conception was because of Mary's purity. In humble sincerity, Mary asked the question, how can this be? Now notice she didn't ask, why are you doing this? She asked, how can this be? You know, many of us, when God tells us to do something, we just often say, why? I can't believe you do this to me, God. No, her, in humble sincerity, just said, how can this be? She said, I've, I'm already betrothed, betrothed to Joseph. I've no, I don't know a man. Humanly, it does not make sense for a virgin to, to conceive and bear a child. The Holy Ghost made it very clear that, that Mary was, in fact, a virgin. So when she questioned, she did not ask, why are you doing this in my life? She just said, how? Which I think would be a fair question for most, most of us. Mary didn't say, why are you doing this to me? No, that would be questioning God and his will. Mary just said, okay, how is it possible? So, okay, you're going to do this in my life. Can you please tell me how? And I think many of us, when we want to serve the Lord, we can ask God how. I don't, have to, I don't necessarily ask God why. I'm like, okay, how, is it, how are you going to do this? This was a woman who was about to be a mother who was allowing the will of her own life to be changed and moved in accordance to God's will. She asked, how can this be? It was this miracle happened because of Mary's purity. But this miracle happened not because of who Mary was, but because of God's power. Because God is the one who's able to work and able to perform miracles. And this miracle was based on God's power to produce a child without a human father who had, who had never began to be. You know, he says, he who never began to be, but eternally existed, began to be what he eternally was not, and continued to be what he eternally was. Which means that God, in his eternal existence, came down and became mankind for us, and he never ceased being God. And we see that Mary here is realizing that this miracle isn't happening because of who I am. This miracle is happening because of who God is. Now, that's the important aspect for our life, mothers, fathers in here. When God works in our life, why do we take so much pride in the things he wants, he's doing in your life? Rather than it should just be magnifying him because he's the one performing the miracles. He's the one doing the work in our life. Our job is just in humble sincerity, look to God and say, God, I, I don't understand, but how are you going to do it? And then when he does it, we can't glorify in what he does. It's his power that does these works. It's his power that changes our life. And we see that Mary here, because of God's power, began working and performed this miracle. Gabriel was careful to point out that this baby was going to be holy. He was not going to share the sinful human nature of mankind that we all have and have inherited. Jesus knew no sin. He did no sin. He had no sin. And his body was prepared for him by the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, when it says he overshadowed Mary is what he said. Verse 37, it tells us, he said, let's quote that again. It says, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. I'm thankful when I read that verse, no matter how ludicrous something may sound, no matter how difficult of some, a process something may seem, when it comes into our life, we understand that nothing's impossible for God. God's able to do anything. So the question is, if God's able to do anything, then why do we so often doubt him? Why do we doubt him so often? He's the one that's able to do work, and he has the power to do anything he wants to. Why is it that we limit God and saying, oh, I, I don't believe he can do this? Why, can't, why do we believe God can't heal someone? Why do we believe that God can't work in someone's life? Why is it that we trust God for salvation, saying that, yes, I deserved hell, but because of his gift, I, can go to, I have forgiveness of my sins. He paid my sin. I can go to heaven. Why do we trust Christ? For the sin debt that's being paid for, why do we trust him for salvation, but we don't trust that he's going to work in my life? Why is it that when something bad happens in our life, we instantly go to God and say, God, I don't understand why you're doing this. Why is it that we doubt him so often? Situations that man deems impossible are no problems to God. And there are many times in our life, there are things like, this doesn't seem possible. This doesn't make sense. 
Maybe you're a mother. Maybe you're a father. Maybe you're trying to support your family. Maybe you're trying to just live the best Christian life possible, and you're like, this just seems impossible, the situation I'm in, but I'm thankful that it says that for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Things that may seem impossible to you are easily attainable and no problem to God. This was the miracle of the conception. We can live our life realizing that God is in total control. That, that God is, in, and it may seem that sometimes parents, uh, and even those who are not parents, that whether you're a child or teenager, you're a young adult or older adult, wet married or single, whatever the case is, there are times that you're living your Christian life and you just say that things just seem out of control. Mary could have easily stepped back and said, this is out of control. I don't want this. What are people going to say about me? Realizing that I, I'm pregnant, they're going to think that I cheated on my spouse. I know that's what they'll think. But here we see that even though things may seem out of control from her perspective, she lived a life full of grace and she just trusted in God and whatever he had for her. Why is it, parents, that so often God has given us our children to steward for him? Your children don't belong to you. Our children were given to us by God to raise them up in the way that they're meant to be and, the, and, and living the Christian life that they're meant to live and following him. Why is it that so often when the struggles and trials of our life come, we think everything's out of control and we don't think God can handle it? This miracle happened because of God's power. And God is just all powerful as he was then as he is today. So we see, the, we, we see number one, the, uh, the message to Mary, and then number two, the miracle of the conception. But let's look at verse number 38, and we see number three, the mind of Mary. We got to look into the, her mind, and this is something that not only can we apply to mothers in here on Mother's Day, but for every single one of us. Luke chapter one, verse 38, for the mind of Mary, we see, and Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me, according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. What was the mind of Mary like? Well, see, her mind was one of a humble spirit. How was she humble? Well, she called herself a handmaid. She was coming to deliver the Son of God into this world, and what did she say? I'm a handmaid. What is a handmaid? A female slave. A bondsmaid. That's the feminine gender of the word bondservant. I'm just a slave. God, whatever you have for me, you're coming, you're going to change my life. I, had, I was prepared. I was living a pure life. I was prepared. I was doing everything I was meant to. I was full of grace, and you're coming in and changing my life. And instead of being angry about what, the direction God was taking in her life, she said, I'm just a slave. What do you have, whatever you have for me, I'm going to do it. Why is it that we so often fight God in the way that he works in our life? God desires us to live for him. He desires us to be in his will. And the moment he begins placing us in his will, we begin fighting it. And not only was this done on a humble, humble spirit, but we see that Mary was presenting herself as a humble servant. She understood that she didn't have much to offer here. She didn't have much to offer the Lord, but she gave herself anyways. What do you mean she didn't have much to offer? If she had much to offer, she wouldn't have called herself a handmaid. No, there's so often times in our spiritual life that you say, God, you can use me. I'm so great. I do this. I do this. I'm living a pure life. I'm living a prepared life. I'm living a grace-filled life. You know what? Use me. I'm, I'm the one that you should be using. And Mary here said, look, I'm just a handmaid. I'm a servant. I'm a slave to God. I don't have much to offer, but God, whatever you have for me, I'm willing to do it. It was a humble spirit. But not only was it a humble spirit, but we see that there was a humble consent that took place. She consented to the will of God. She consented to his will, even though Mary didn't understand what was happening to her or how it was going to work out or how God was going to work in her life. She surrendered her will to the Lord. That I don't understand what's going to take place, but I will understand. Here's the thing. When you face circumstances that seem impossible, we have to remember to surrender our will to God's. There are going to be so many times in our life where you have your plan. Mary had her plan. And God came and changed her plan. 
And this is for all of us in here, whether you're a mother or a father or a child or a grandparent, whatever it is today, there are going to be times you may have your plans and God's going to come in and radically change the plans. And we see not only was she humble, but she had a humble consent to it. She consented to his will. She didn't understand why it was happening. She couldn't explain all the situations in her life, but he just said, I'm just a handmaid to the Lord. When things arise in our life, yeah, we can live a pure life. Yeah, we can live a separated life. We can be a prepared person. But when God comes in and directs us in his will, our question, our, our statement that we should make is not standing up before God and saying, God, why are you doing this? I had my plans. The goal then is saying, I'm a handmaid. I'm a servant. I'm a slave to you. You know, when we face circumstances that seem impossible, we have to remember to surrender to God's plan. There are many times in our life that we have to surrender to what God wants in our life because he has something far greater than what any of us can expect anyways. The world's most popular prayer is thy will be changed. But the world's greatest prayer is thy will be done. We live our lives that God changed these situations in my life. I, I don't want this. Mary could have easily said, no, I don't want it. And what would have took place? If Mary looked at Gabriel and says, I don't want it, then what would have happened? Would she have consented to what God wanted to do? We have to remember that our prayer should not be, thy will be changed, but it should be, thy will be done. God, what do you have for my life? As a mother in here trying to raise children, uh, for many of uh, mothers in here, and for fathers trying to raise children, and for people who aren't married that are just trying to do what's right, we say, God, why are you allowing this? Change your will. It's very easy to ask for your will to be changed rather than his will to be done. She consented to his will. Not only did she consent to his will, but she consented to his word because it says that she took his word. And Mary, in this passage, Mary is perhaps the most extraordinary illustration recorded in the Bible of a life wholly yielded to God. God, I had my plans and you changed it. She laid her will aside and trusted God completely for his perfect plan for her life. I assure you, when we give our life to him, he has something far better than anything we could have ever thought or imagined. And I know what it's like for mothers and fathers in here today. We like to control. We want to try to make sure that everything's as perfect as possible. But there are times in our life where God directs and God changes, and we just have to follow the Lord. She consented to his word. She said, look, I'm giving my life up. Everything that I desired, everything that I wanted, I don't know how it's going to be received by people. I don't know how someone's going to receive it and look at me, if they're going to look at me any different. I'm just going to completely trust that God's in control. Wherever God speaks to us through his word, we should humbly respond to it and yield to his will. God, I read your word. I, you speak to me. And rather than looking at it and being upset and angry, saying, God, I don't want to do that. I want something different. We should say as mothers and fathers in here, God, you spoke to me through your word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consent, humbly consent to what you have. And I'm going to follow you. Here's the truth of the matter is that God is ready to assume full responsibility of a life wholly yielded to him. I'm thankful that when we live our Christian life, mothers in here, fathers in here, when we live our life for him, yield your life to him. He's ready to assume that full responsibility for that life. You know, even though God may ask to, us to do something that seems impossible, moms, we should have the faith to believe in his word and yield to his will, knowing that God has something far better than anything that we can think or plan for ourselves. You know, I think of when Holly and I, we moved to Southern California three and a half years ago, it was a very difficult decision to make because in Kentucky, we were comfortable. We had family near us. We had a home. Uh, things were a lot cheaper in Kentucky than they are in Southern California. And um, there was, we had a great church that we were part of and we were working at. We had a two-year-old at the time and we come out here and before we decided to come out here, I looked at Holly and was like, Holly, we can't make it. We're, we're going to get a pay cut and go to the most expensive state. We can't afford anything out here. And Holly looked me in the eyes and said, I thought you said you wanted to do something for the Lord. Talk about making me feel bad, supposed to be that, have that kind of faith. And then I remember we said yes to coming. And then the moment we said yes to coming, the very next day we found out that Holly was pregnant with Xander. 
and now talk about making things even more difficult. We sold everything we had, and I'm talking about this from the perspective of Holly as a mother. We sold everything we had, packed it up in a seven foot by seven foot pod, had it shipped out here, packed up the last couple of bags in our little car, and drove across the country, leaving everything behind, sold our house, sold everything, and left family and friends and everybody behind and moved across country with a two-year-old daughter and a pregnant wife, only to live in a camper next to the, next to the church when we first came because we couldn't afford to come here. Now imagine in Holly's perspective, being a mother, leaving everything behind, selling everything, burning every bridge, only to be pregnant with morning sickness in a trailer with a two-year-old running back and forth, shaking that trailer constantly all day. <laughs> you know, where is our faith in the Lord? And I'm not saying that to boost Holly in any way. What I'm, what I'm saying that for is for us to understand that there are times that God wants to work in our life. And so often we say, I'm not doing it. I don't want to do it. Rather, God has something far greater for us. And our job is just with a humble spirit, humbly consent to what God wants to do in our life. The faith that, be, that this kind of faith begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. If we do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we will not have that kind of faith. We will not be able to go up before the Lord as men and women and says, Jesus, I'm your slave. God, whatever you have for me, I'm your slave. Work in my life. Lord, I'm going to do my best to live a pure life. I'm going to live my best to live a prepared life. I'm going to live my best to be a, have a grace-filled life with a humble spirit desiring whatever you have for me. I'll do whatever you want. It will not happen until we have faith that begins with Jesus Christ. And it's important to remember that this Jesus whom Gabriel announced in this passage is that same Jesus who was going to go and die on the cross of Calvary. The Holy Son of God took upon himself every sin that we've ever committed. And he was willing to go and pay that debt in full on that cross. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior today, then you can call upon him and he can save you. He can forgive you of your sins. If you do know him today, then I'd request that we live a life of purity and humility, coming before him saying, God, whatever you have for me, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to be that mother or father I'm meant to be. I'm willing to be that, that disciple, that follower of Christ that I'm meant to be because I know you have something far greater than anything that I have right here on this earth right now. And in my mind, you have something far greater in, in plan and store for my life. I just want to be a humble servant for you. Let's pray.